So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for those who are already adding into the chat where they're based and the organisation they're with. Please do carry on um, adding that while we just introduce the webinar today. Um, I'm Hannah Broadbent, I'm the Head of Communications at Ember, and I'm really pleased to welcome you all to the launch of our third annual Global Electricity Review. The report aims to provide the most transparent and up-to-date overview of changes in the global electricity sector last year, with open data on over 200 countries around the world. We make all of the data freely accessible to allow others to do their own analysis and help speed the switch to clean electricity. Right now, we're witnessing extraordinary events in relation to our global security and global energy systems. Even as these immediate issues must draw our attention, the longer term severe threat of climate change is only growing. We know that decarbonizing the global electricity system by 2040 is critical to keep 1.5 within reach. It will also ultimately help to reduce energy insecurity and exposure to geopolitical risks. At Ember, we continue to advocate for an urgent transition from coal to clean electricity. We gather, curate and analyze data on the global power sector and its impacts on the climate. Then we use this data to shift the conversation towards high impact policies and we empower other ad advocates to do the same. We have a growing team of power sector experts based across Asia and Europe. And we're delighted to work with partners around the world to increase our reach and impact. Today, you'll hear from several of my colleagues. And right now I'll hand you over to Nick in our data team and please, use the Q&A function throughout the, the talk to raise any questions that you'd like us to answer later. Over to you, Nick. Thank you, Anna. Um, with the Global Electricity Review, we not only hope to provide you uh, with analysis, but also an open data set um, of electricity data. One of the fundamental challenges um, of energy data is that it's often not easily accessible and can sometimes be even two or more years uh, behind. Um, but we know that timely and open data is necessary to inform policy and judge whether we are on track to meet our climate goals. Ember's data team gathers and curates annual and monthly electricity generation data from over national, 60 national sources and other sources to compile our open data set that we're sharing with you today. Um, the data forming the basis of the analysis that you'll hear today will cover 209 countries for the period from 2000 to 2020, and will also include more recent 2021 data for 75 countries that represent 93% of global power demand and 98% of global coal generation. Um, open data is, is always a collective effort. So although sometimes it's, it's quite difficult, um, our work extends and really relies on amazing work by other organizations and projects, for example, open um, open NEM in Australia, who provide free, reliable, and easily accessible electricity data that is key in enabling the kind of in-depth analysis that we want to share with you today. Um, and um, always please reach out to us if you uh, have any questions regarding our data or any improvements. Um, we're um, always, always ready to hear your feedback on that. And all of the data that we talk about today and more can also be found on our website as a download um, or in our new data explorer where you can explore the most important electricity data sets yourself and you can find the insights that you are uh, most interested in. Back to you, Anna. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'll now introduce my colleagues who'll share the key findings of our research. Um, so first up, you'll hear from Dave Jones, who's Ember's global program lead. He's based in the UK and has been an electricity analyst for 20 years, including at German utility E.ON. At Ember, he's led the publication of our Global Electricity Review and the expansion of our team into Asia, as well as developing our focus area on coal mine methane. After him, you'll hear from Aditya Lola, who's a senior analyst in our Asia team. He's published several analyses on policies that can help India accelerate its clean electricity transition, and will soon be publishing a subnational state-by-state -state renewables tracker. Before Ember, he had hands-on experience of renewables rollout, managing projects that covered around 50,000 homes across India. Uh, so over to you, Dave. Thanks so much, Hannah. Uh, thanks, Nick, and uh, welcome to everyone, and thank you for attending. I'm pleased to um, 
uh, drop in any questions as you have as we go along. Uh, we'd love to have a bit of a time for, for discussion afterwards about uh, anything. I Sorry to interrupt, Dave. I think it'd be best if you put your mic a little closer to your mouth. It's a bit quiet. Perfect. Ah, there we go. Cool. OK, so I'll start going through the four key findings of an analysis of, uh, of that data that, that Nick described. Our first key finding is that wind and solar generated over a tenth of global electricity in 2021 for the first time. Wind and solar have arrived. They are the top two fastest growing electricity sources, but they need to maintain very high growth rates year on year to bring us on track uh, for one and a half degrees. The second key finding is that electricity demand grew very rapidly in 2021, at twice the long-term average as it bounced back from lockdown in 2020 adding the equivalent of India's total electricity demand. And despite the rising wind and solar, only about 30% of that demand growth was met with clean electricity. 60% was met with coal power, and that pushed global coal power to a new record, beating the previous record set back in 2018. Countries across Asia saw the fastest electricity demand rise, pushing coal power to new records in China, India and beyond. And that rise in coal power, along with a modest rise in gas generation, meant power sector emissions also set an all-time high. And before I go into the report's findings in detail, I just want to talk you through what one and a half degrees means for the power sector. In May last year, the International Energy Agency, the IEA, published its monumental net zero by 2050 report. It shows that for one and a half degrees by 2030, in just eight years from now, Wind and solar, which is uh, in dark green here, rise to become 40% of global electricity generation. And coal generation in black needs to fall by over two thirds without leading to a rise in gas generation. And it shows that by 2040, coal power is completely phased out. Unabated gas is almost completely phased out. And this turns the power sector from the biggest emitting sector today to the first sector to hit net zero in 2040. At the same time, as all of this, electricity generation doubles, powering a new electrified global economy, helping to decarbonize transport, heating and industry, all powered by clean electricity. And it shows wind and solar at the backbone of this future energy system, providing three quarters of the growth in clean electricity. And that I hope explains why I'll be spending a little bit of time on our first key finding. And that first key finding is that wind and solar generated over a tenth of global electricity for the first time. That's more than double of when the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015. Wind generated almost twice as much electricity as solar. However, solar generation is growing much faster. It's been the fastest growing electricity generation source now for 17 years in a row. Wind and solar take, taken together overtook nuclear power for the first time in 2021 making them the fourth largest source of electricity in the world. This graph shows the share of wind and solar by region. You can see at the top, it's Europe that's leading on the transition. The nine out of 10 countries with the highest wind and solar penetration are in Europe. Uh, it's the Netherlands, the UK, Greece, Germany, and Spain. They all had over a quarter of their electricity from wind and solar alone in 2021. And Denmark was over half. And in Asia, wind and solar is now uh, really taking off. Uh, China and Japan crossed that 10% marker in 2021 for the first time. So that now the world's five biggest economies are over that threshold. Vietnam and Turkey are over a tenth. India is close. Australia is flying away, leading the region with incredible growth in the last two years. In the Americas, most key countries are now over that threshold. And Uruguay is ranked as the highest uh, since 2016. In Africa and the Middle East, uh, there are some good examples, though in general it's lagging other regions. Uh, future COP hosts, Egypt and UAE, stand at just 3%. But there's big momentum in the region. Um, to take Saudi Arabia as an example, it had 99% of its electricity from fossil fuels in 2021, but promises that 50% will come from renewables by 2030. And what in this graphic we found most interesting was just how many countries are building up wind and solar so rapidly. 50 countries have now passed a tenth of electricity, 10 countries have passed a quarter. The discussion on whether wind and solar will be the backbone of our future electricity system is over. What matters now is how quickly 
that transition happens. The three countries which transformed the, their electricity system the fastest um, since the pandemic were Netherlands, Australia and Vietnam. They each switched almost a tenth of their total electricity demand to wind and solar in just the last two years. What's more, that new wind and solar in each of these three countries led to a fall in both coal and in gas generation. And Vietnam offers a very hopeful story. In just one year, it tripled its solar generation to become the world's 10th largest solar generator in, in 2021. Change can happen very quickly. So how do we get on target for one and a half degrees? The answer is to maintain that year on year high growth rate of wind and solar that we've seen so far. Over the last 10 years, wind and solar have grown, generation have grown on average by 20% every year. And it needs to continue at that 20% growth rate every year this decade. It's obviously harder to maintain high growth rates as an industry becomes bigger in scale and more mature, but it's been done before and it needs to be done again. When we first started writing the report, we were interested in well, what weighs 10% a major milestone on this rapid ascent upwards. Experience in countries that have passed that 10% marker shows a more holistic view is needed from the government if rapid growth is to continue. Governments need to help fast track planning, applications and grid connections for new projects to contract enough uh, ocean capacity to plan for land use, to plan for more storage, to strengthen grids, to plan for market design changes and also to plan for the phase down of fossil to enable just transition. So sure governments need to be making long-term super ambitious commitments, uh, like for example, where Germany's moved to 100% clean power by 2035. But they also need to get their hands dirty with the details of this transition. Companies are ready and waiting to install, finance is now ready and the public is now wanting. The bottleneck is increasingly with governments um, and they are the gatekeepers to unlock this potential. If we move on to the next slide, um, uh, we can turn to the other sources of clean electricity. So where wind and solar are already the majority of clean uh, electricity, other clean sources still have a role to play. And at the moment, they're stalling. Hydro fell on dry conditions in 2021, especially in China and Turkey, uh, but also new installations are slowing rather than rising. Nuclear rose in 2021 um, as existing reactors returned back into service. Um, in France and Japan. Um, in China and Russia, um, new reactors got bought online, but long term, uh, long time scales will prevent a rapid surge in nuclear power this decade. Bioenergy grew 6%, um, but concerns continue to be raised about its true emissions impact. And there can only be an increased reliance on bioenergy where it's proved to be sustainable. And it's hope emerging clean technologies will play a role going forward. Uh, however, it's still early days. Hydrogen-based power generation is not yet happening at scale, but the critical enablers for it are fast falling into place. Um, CCS carbon capture and storage is always the mirage that has yet to deliver. And a series of other technologies like geothermal, marine and concentrated uh, solar panel are hoped to play in these roles in the future. Stalling on these technologies will make it even more difficult to achieve emissions cuts that are needed this decade. The second key finding uh, we had was on electricity demand growth. You can see on the grayed out bar that electricity demand rose by 5% in 2021, and that followed a small fall in 2020. The 2021 rise was the fastest since uh, 2010, and approximately the equivalent of adding a new India to the world's electricity demand. On the left-hand side of the graphic, you can see many advanced countries rebounded after the fall in 2020 back to pre-pandemic levels. But the real growth continues to be in Asia on the right-hand side, in large part as economic growth boomed in 2021. In many Asian countries, electricity demand grew, even grew in 2020 when lockdowns were at the harshest. And that means in China, for example, electricity demand is now 14% higher than it was before the pandemic. And because of that first fast rise in electricity demand, that leads us to our third key finding, the record rise in coal power. Coal power rose by 9% in 2021. It's the biggest rise since at least 1985. It more than rebounded from its fall in 2020 to set an all-time high beating the previous record in 2018 by 2%.
Coal's new 2021 record shows just how far off track the electricity transition is. So the IEA's one and a half degree pathway, unabated coal power uh, generation must now fall by 73% uh, from 2021 to 2030. China's share of global coal power was 54%. Such deep falls in coal power can't be done by, the, by Europe and US alone. All countries will need to be phasing down coal this decade. And now I'll hand over to my colleague Addy to explain a little bit more about why we saw that fall in coal last year. Over to you, Addy. Thank you, Dave. Uh, morning, afternoon, evening, everybody from wherever you're joining us. Uh, Dave uh, just spoke about how uh, global electricity demand soared in 2021 and how coal power rose to meet this uh, demand growth. I'll now use uh, three charts to explain how this has uh, come about. I'll start by talking about coal uh, and, and more particularly about how coal met much of the increase in uh, power demand in 2021, like the title of this chart. Uh, uh, suggest the simple reason uh, was that uh, clean electricity was not deployed fast enough uh, to keep up with the unprecedented demand growth uh, that we've seen uh, last year. If you look at the dark green uh, stacks in the columns of the chart, you'll see that uh, wind and solar generation has been increasing uh, in absolute terms year on year, and uh, and even 2021 saw a record rise in wind and solar generation. But this was nowhere near enough to meet uh, the overall uh, new demand, which was added in 2021. It was enough to meet just 29% of uh, total demand uh, last year. Other clean sources, they have uh, combined uh, to provide uh, no new net growth. Uh, this meant that uh, fossil generation uh, uh, kind of uh, had to cater for the rest of the demand base. And of that, uh, coal uh, accounted for uh, uh, coal accounted for 59% uh, of the total demand rise in uh, 2021. As a result, like uh, Dave uh, mentioned some time back, uh, like coal generation rose by 9% last year, which is the biggest uh, percentage rise on record uh, since at least uh, 1985. Now, uh, next slide, please. Now, what is interesting uh, is that uh, much of this growth uh, has, has been driven by uh, record coal generations seen in uh, China and India. China and India are the two most uh, populous countries in the world. Uh, two of the fastest growing uh, countries in the world and also uh, and, and certainly uh, the top two coal power countries in the world. So what happens in these countries are uh, important uh, for global electricity transition. In China, uh, coal generation rose by about 10%. Uh, this is about uh, uh, 466 terawatt hours in absolute terms, uh, uh, then, uh, and which, which is equivalent to Japan and Germany's uh, coal generation combined. So that is massive. But China, on the other hand, has also been dominating the world on clean electricity deployment. Uh, it has uh, seen record uh, clean electricity generation last year, but that was enough to meet just uh, one third of its uh, total uh, electricity demand rise. As a result, coal uh, met 64% of uh, demand rise in 2021. The story is somewhat similar in India. Uh, it, it's Clean electricity deployments uh, are increasing but slowly but surely, uh, but uh, it, it meant that only 12% of electricity demand growth uh, last year was uh, met with clean power. Uh, and the uh, rest of the, uh, the demand rise uh, came from coal. As a result, uh, coal generation spiked by 11% uh, uh, last year after two years of falling coal, which the country has seen. So next slide, please. So what about the other uh, big coal power countries? To understand that, uh, we looked at the top 10 uh, uh, coal power countries that accounted for 90% of uh, global coal generation. Outside uh, China and India, uh, you'll see that uh, Indonesia uh, seems to have hit uh, a new uh, record uh, uh, in terms of coal generation. This is based on provisional data available uh, from the country. Uh, data usually uh, uh, gets published uh, with a one year uh, gap. So the, the initial estimate suggests that uh, coal generation in Indonesia has also increased. Uh, coal also coal power has also rebounded strongly in countries like uh, uh, United States, uh, Japan, and Germany uh, compared to 2020 levels. But uh, they have uh, interestingly remained below the 2019 levels, the pre-pandemic 2019 levels. The, the rebound in coal generation was mainly due to rebound in electricity demand, but partly also due to a rise in uh, gas prices. So. What happened uh, last year was that in, in, in February of 2021, we have seen Texan energy crisis. And then to, uh, towards the end of uh, last year, we've seen uh, high uh, spikes of uh, spikes in gas prices in Europe. All this meant that renewables uh, actually replaced uh, uh, gas instead of replacing coal. As a result, uh, coal exit uh, has been interrupted. 
and uh, the world is uh, this is putting world a little off track uh, from uh, clean electricity transition. Dave, Dave previously mentioned uh, about IES uh, 1.5 uh, degree net way uh, net zero pathway. It requires uh, OECD countries to phase out uh, coal by 2030 and uh, the rest of the world uh, by 2040. And to lend some context uh, of these uh, top 10 coal power countries, only Germany has uh, a, a coal uh, phase out by 2030 uh, commitment. I'll stop at that and hand it uh, over back to Dave. Uh, thanks very much, Adi. Um, so if I move on to our fourth key finding, um, fourth key finding was that um, uh, emission uh, record, there was a record rise in, in emissions from the power sector, um, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly given that rise in coal, um, coupled with a modest rise in gas generation of 1%, it meant power sector emissions rose by 7% in 2021. It's the largest rise since uh, uh, 2010. And it beats the previous all-time high uh, set in 2018 by 3%. Emissions growth is obviously in sharp contrast for what's need needed for the IEA's 1.5 degrees pathway, which is a 60% fall in power sector emissions from 2021 to 2030. The power sector is, is, is meant to be the, the low-hanging fruit, seeing the quickest falls in emissions, yet it's still setting new highs. And just um, one, well, one final part on that, which is when you view it from a carbon intensity perspective, uh, the world's electricity on average actually got slightly dirtier by 1% in 2021. It was the first year that the world's electricity has got dirtier uh, since 2011. So if we just move on to the final slide and try and summarize what, what all of this means. But what, what needs to happen for one and a half degrees and where are we? We saw coal power rise by 9% in 2021, but it needs to start falling, uh, falling very rapidly. And that would happen if wind and solar consistently maintain those very high growth rates. It will also require growth in other sources of clean electricity where they're currently stored. And it requires a stop in gas as eternal rise, which thankfully, perhaps, seems to be at a turning point. Amidst the energy crisis and Putin's war, governments are seeking to avoid expensive fossil fuels and look for homegrown energy sources. It's clear the biggest winners will be wind and solar. You can already see that with a raft of announcements by countries across Europe to step up. The energy crisis pushed up coal prices uh, three times. Um, of what they were this time last year, but gas prices in many regions by 10 times. COP26 last year brought into focus the issue of phase out on coal power. But with price and security issues of gas, now governments are wanting out of gas as well. They want no one out of two fossil fuels. And the only way, rational way out of this is to deploy wind and solar at lightning speed. We really hope governments are ready to step up to that challenge. I do hope our analysis has been helpful in some ways. I do hope that you get a chance yourself to look at that data and to pull your own thoughts from that data. So I thank you very much for taking your time today to join us. Um, and I'll pass over to Hannah. Thanks, Dave, and thanks, Adi. Um, we've got some great questions coming into the, to the Q&A, so we'll um, start answering these. I'll put the questions forward to you and please everyone continue to add any other questions that, that you'd like to hear answered uh, we'll also have me joining us um out on the panel to to help answer these questions um so i think one one thing uh, that's definitely coming up from in the questions that we're seeing is kind of what can we learn from the countries that have already achieved a high penetration of wind and solar so Akshay asked, you know, what from a technical perspective allowed the Netherlands, Australia and Vietnam to switch so rapidly, given the limitations of the grid, etc. Um, and Archie's asked, you know, what penetration of renewables does the marginal value of investing in storage start exceeding the value of more renewables? Do Uruguay and Denmark provide any insights on this? Um, perhaps you could, you know, give us a bit of an outline. What are we seeing that's working? Um, in both the rapid scale up and then the successful uh, kind of deployment of, of high penetration of renewables. Dave, do you want to start us or? Yeah, sure. So, 
Yeah, so uh, Denmark um, is a really interesting one. I think the, the, the clearest example from Denmark is to start early, um, be consistent, and have a have a, a vision that you see through on that. They um, they made some really early advances on on wind and made it clear they wanted to make it as a um, as a major source of their electricity generation going forward these electricity generators the, the transition takes time um, so we kind of showed what can happen in a couple of years um, but we need to get all the way to 100 percent clean electricity so even at breakneck speed this transition is going to take um, a decade or two decades not not just not just a few years um, and to keep going for that long you need longevity of these processes you need uh, you need the government to have some form of uh, um, direction about how fast they want to go and some kind of consistency and predictability of how they issue auctions um, and also how they step up around that. And there, there's an interesting question on on uh, on California, which uh, I've seen that, that the movie wants to answer, which he might give a bit more detail of some of the, the, the bits that go that, that underpin that. Yes, and I may just firstly add on to Dave's answer in regard to Denmark. I think uh, there is an IEA report published in 2019, if I recall and remember it correctly. It says that one of the key reasons why Denmark can achieve a high level of renewable penetration is because it has well established interconnection with neighboring countries. And it's, uh, you know, it's this interconnections enable Denmark to source flexibility and backup capacity from neighboring countries to maintain supply sufficiency, especially during extreme weather conditions. And uh, uh, in regard to the, that, uh, the questions about the, uh, the California crisis, I think I'm not very familiar with what happened there, but I think in China, we experienced similar situation last year. And I think the key insight I, uh, you know, I, I think we can draw from out of this experience is that if we have higher level of wind and solar penetration, that means that we need more backup capacity to maintain supply sufficiency, especially during prolonged extreme weather. Especially in, China, in Northern China, you know, we have cold winter night with no sunshine and very limited output from uh, wind capacity because of the cold weather. So, in, and, and, and before energy storage technology can provide sufficient uh, backup capacity, I think uh, we have to somehow rely on fossil capacity to provide this backup, namely coal and uh, gas. This means that you know, fossil fuel capacity is still needed but we may, say, we may see reduced generation from them. And the la very la you know, less capacity utilization rate for fossil capacity, but not necessarily less capacity, but less generation from them. Because we use them for less hours, but to provide sufficient backup to maintain so, uh, supply sufficiency. Hope this answers your question, thank you. Hannah, back to you. Thanks both. <clears throat> and I can see Paul uh, Domjan in the chat has also kind of mentioned about what you were saying around Denmark, really, that a small country with good interconnection um, can achieve that. But as, as we've seen from uh, colleagues mentioning around uh, California, the challenge is as, as these kind of growth rates get higher, how do you continue maintaining that? Um, I, I was interested to see a question from Deeksha as well that um sort of again questions that how feasible are these high growth rates that we're talking about um and details us specifically um you mentioned that the onus on governments on prioritizing renewables but what is your take on indian government's seriousness on coal to clean transition especially with rising electricity demand perhaps adi you could share a few thoughts yeah i'd be happy to take that one well um to answer that question, I think it's important to kind of uh, uh, like you know provide a little bit of context on to context on India's priorities. India's biggest priority right now is energy security, and and uh, there are some un uncertainties at the moment, especially post pandemic, which uh, the Indian uh, power system modelers are grappling with. 
Uh, one such uh, uh, like you know uncertainty is what you have pointed out, which is rising electricity demand. Uh, in the in the short to mid term, it is anybody's guess how electricity demand is going to rise because it is uh, in large part dependent on uh, how India recovers from uh, the pandemic and in small part from the, the global uh, gas prices, uh, the gas prices and things like that. So. So that is one dimension of it, which the, the, the government is trying to understand. I think once there is a bit more clarity on that, uh, the government can be more confident about its own, uh, like, you know, targets and own, uh, like, you know, uh, RE targets for 2030 and also for 2022. That's the first part of it. The second uh, dimension of that is that uh, India is also a federal system where you have a central level policy and you have uh, individual states which have their own uh, policies. It, uh, and right now, there seems to be a case of left hand not uh, uh, like entirely talking well to the right hand, uh, because of which uh, there is a little bit of gap in uh, when it, gap when it comes to implementation. Uh, a recent report, uh, I, I, you are from Korea. I think your uh, one of your reports uh, has actually shown that uh, 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 like in 500 gigawatt non-fossil capacity target, which India has announced at COP26, that would be enough. Uh, uh, to kind of uh, to ensure that coal coal generation uh, remains at the current level, uh, if the demand grows by five percent, IEA says uh, demand can grow by four to five percent. So even if you take that per uh, limit of five percent, that should be enough. So to answer your question more specifically, uh, seriousness. Uh, it, I think the Indian government. My personal view is that the Indian government wants to be serious, but at the same time. There are some questions uh, which it needs to answer. Oh, another thing which I kind of have to mention here is that uh, we've talked about the variability and the problems of grid integration and things like that. India is a massive country and with a massive uh, solar and wind fleet, uh, like adding on into the grid, uh, like you know, flexibility and the sto storage capabilities also become a big issue. So there are technical challenges as well. And I think at the uh, inter-ministerial level, these are the discussions which are going on. And I think, uh, Next few months, uh, I think we will uh, probably see a bit more movement as uh, we are uh, coming into a little bit of a stable period uh, post uh, pandemic. Hope that answers your question. Thank <clears throat> Thanks, Adi. Um, we'll answer a few more of the questions that are coming up on renewables and the kind of practicalities of these high penetration rates we're talking about. And then we'll move on to some of the questions that are popping up around the current gas crisis and what that might mean for the future of coal. Um, so I guess to go back to some of the, the questions that we've seen here, um, uh, there was a, a kind of question from Andrew, which was asking, you know, it's easy to add the first chunk of renewables to electricity systems. Um, wind and solar are reaching record lows as a cost per kilowatt hour. But when you get to sort of beyond 50% integration, it can get a lot more costly, needing to add storage into connections across time zones, et cetera. Um, are there models that show how this will impact the cost of the system transformation to 2035? What does that long term um, outlook uh, look like? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I think that um, just on the, the, the levels of penetration as you increase, it's, um, it, it's obvious that the, the, the further up you go towards 100%, um, the, the harder that harder that comes to 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 balance the storage issues of, of wind and solar to be able to create have that electricity deliver um, when you want it. Um, so um, in it's really nice to see such countries already kind of coping with that. I mean, we, we said about Denmark relying on interconnectors, but actually now with Germany one side, with Sweden the other side of Denmark, it's that the whole of Europe and especially Northern Europe is building up on a very wind-based uh, electricity system where there's kind of quite high correlations of wind across countries. So these problems are already live, they're already being, being dealt with today. And every day that goes on, there's kind of more innovation into this field that, that it, kind of, it kind of means that where you're looking at the 2035 modeling for getting to 100% clean power, it's very hard to work out exactly what that means. So sure, there's, there's all sorts of models that have done that. That are going through but just every day that goes on there's another answer to come in that hasn't been thought about that helps with some aspect of the storage or some aspect of ancillary service or um, or whatever it is that that helps provide some grid security in there um, and then that's really reassuring when you look at the the number of um, the, the fact that there's a few kind of countries that are kind of leading the way on this 
when the kind of the rest of the world catches up there they can learn from some of those experiences and see what's going on and that toolbox that we've got to work with is 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 growing by the day um the the, the exciting things for me is some of the long term the longer term energy storage um technologies that are being developed um that are going to need to um need to bridge uh, a couple of weeks um in winter um uh, with with, with less amounts of wind generation across Europe. Um, in countries like India, it's a bit easier where you've got the diurnal aspect of solar and you're relying on solar. So a lot of the time that storage aspect is, um, is less and you might rely on different tools in the toolbox like about how to move air conditioning load to more match up with where the sun is. Um, so there's all sorts of tools out there. It makes it very hard to, 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 to come up with any form of modeling and any form of modeling um, uh, on how much of those costs will be as you go all the way up for those those that um, towards 100% um, uh, really got to be using a, a lot of imagination about the technologies that are going to be involved because they are they are evolving so quickly. Thank you. Thanks. Adi or do you have any things you'd like to add? I know we've also seen um, a comment from Karthi Kayan asking whether any countries with high penetration of RES are, are using having policies to use used batteries from electric vehicles as a storage option. And Archie asked, you know, does overcapacity look like the best route to firm power from what you've seen? Perhaps you've got any other comments you'd like to add? Yeah, on uh, uh, high VRE penetration, I think it is something which uh, countries like India uh, actually like, you know, actively trying to find a solution for it because right now uh, India has about uh, 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 one, 104 gigawatts of renewables on grid already and that in itself is uh, creating some grid related issues in some, some certain points uh, uh, of the grid uh, in India. So there are discussions going on at a uh, high level, uh, particularly in India, like, you know, there are discussions not just around battery storage, there are also discussions around using, possibly using green hydrogen as a, as a, so, as a backup source and things like that. So that is one aspect of it. To, uh, on uh, EV batteries, uh, the, there is also a talk, uh, uh, there, 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 there is some, inter again, steering committee discussions with, uh, going on in India, especially, I'm talking about India because my expertise mainly uh, lies in India, uh, but, but there are discussions uh, uh, going on where like, uh, with, they're exploring the possibility of using EV, used EV batteries as a, 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 a backup system for, a decentralized uh, 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 RE unit. So there are uh, all kinds of uh, R and D in policy that is happening at the moment, uh, but uh, nothing which is which is kind of uh, uh, been implemented in, in in large scale. And your second question on the second question on overcapacity. Well, uh, it is not always an ideal solution because uh, it, it also depends on the country in which uh, you are operating in. For a country like India, which is still uh, like, you know, considered a poor country and it still has millions of people uh, in poverty, uh, the options uh, get very limited because you, uh, you have to optimize everything uh, with uh, economic cost. So, uh, so uh, for a country like India to, to kind of uh, to leap, leapfrog uh, uh, all fossils uh, into a clean uh, power grid, you would need uh, to also look at uh, like you know look at how how best uh, the, like they can optimize uh, their resources so that makes it a little difficult to even have uh, over capacity to be, uh, built into the system and um, just uh, just it's an interesting point on the used battery side um, the, i think the, one of the biggest changes in the last few years oh, so it's been all sorts of changes in electric vehicle technology in the last few years but one of the one of the the, the most amazing changes has just been about how how that degradation of battery has been reduced. So the new Teslas are now running um, on a, I, I think I'm right in saying they're running a, on a million miles on, 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 a, on a battery before it reaches a, um, a critical point of degradation. So, the, so actually the important thing is not about how you, how you use the use batteries. The important thing is about how do you use the electric car in itself as part of the grid? Do you, do you use it in a passive context where you go out to a service station, like you fill your petrol at the moment, fill it in a supercharger that takes you know five minutes um, at, when you want it to discharge or recharge? 
or do you have it plugged in overnight where it's actually part of um, the electricity system in itself or like part of that smart electricity system that can charge when uh, the hours um, the suits the grid and even discharge back into the grid to support it when it's needed um, and, and you do see um, some uh, some advancements on that, but there are all sorts of issues un underpinning that that governments need to get their head around around market design and tariffs and all sorts of bits, which is why we're at that stage now where governments need to get deeper, they need, they need to get their hands dirty with the electricity transition to understand these things and um, uh, and that requires uh, that requires quite a lot of effort on the part of the governments. Thanks all. And so I think, you know, the, the remaining big question uh, that we're hearing from, from Roy, from Camila, from Abdul Rahman, is really a reflection on where the world is right now. Um, they're asking, you know, will the gas crisis that we're seeing lead to more coal burning and could emissions rise to a new record in 2022? The, the the within Europe we it was kind of only in the start of October we saw the really rapid rise up in gas prices so all of this is slightly new territory at the moment with the amount of coal gas switching there might be and 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 how that pans out relative to um, to clean generation one of the the big unknowns at the moment is just how quickly that um, overall electricity demand will will pick up again this year so. Um, I, I don't mean to, I didn't normally sit on the fence with these things, <laughs> but we need a little bit more information first on, on how fast they are. There's a, some really um, um, in, important countries out there like Korea and Japan that um, are looking to phase out coal, but also have an awful lot of gas generation in the mix. So as we go through this year and next year, um, how will that impact the balance? Will that that spike in gas price really start uh, reducing the amount of, of, coal, of gas generation and, and, and inputting coal. It's a, a little bit early to say, and we, we haven't had a chance yet to really to really think about that. I guess over the next month or two, uh, there'll be some some views coming out of that. But clearly, it's, it's something that that worries us a lot. That we had this momentum to start phasing uh, to phasing out coal. We had a really nice focus on it. And now it's been slightly distracted by a gas crisis at the same time. So, uh, so it's really now to see that government step up to that and, and, and actually double the efforts um, of what they had before, knowing that um, knowing that they 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 don't want gas as part of the mix as well. I, I, thanks, Dave. I, I do have one point to add on here, and you know now we see loss of turbulence in the in global. Uh, 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 geopolitical and economic landscapes. And I think this may risk distracting countries' attention from redressing climate change because climate change is long-term challenge. But you know, many countries nowadays, they are facing lots of immediate challenges. So the government may tend to redress immediate challenges, but delay their efforts towards addressing long-term challenges, in our case, climate change. So that's, that's, that's my, the point I want to add on to this, uh, this question. Thanks, Anna, please. Thanks, all. And a, a final question from myself. Um, could, obviously the crisis that we're seeing could risk um, derailing climate targets, but could it also be a turning point where governments step up and um, embra embrace clean electricity as a solution to the multiple challenges they're facing? Um, absolutely. Um, you left the one question up from 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 Camilla and Alaza in co like in in, co in, uh, in tandem to that, which is that there is this um, there, there's a potential for um, a rebound in uh, of some sort in coal as um, as as that gas crisis goes through and through the summer. But 
what we know, we've already seen that response, like part of that response in Europe so far, which has been for, um, a, um, a series of um, government announcements about stepping up on wind and solar already. So we've seen the Netherlands government's come out to double the 2030 offshore wind targets. We've seen the Italian government's come out to fast track some offshore uh, wind projects um, um, to be con to start construction very quickly and, and then to set longer term targets for, for offshore wind. We see the UK come out yesterday um, with some stronger wind and solar targets. You, we've already seen that a lot and that's playing out at the moment. It'd be interesting at this turning point, um, as you call it, Hannah, about how different governments react in different ways. Um, but when you've got the underlying situation, which is that coal prices tripled, gas prices um, had a zero on it, and you're in a world of wanting homegrown, um, uh, more homegrown electricity, wind and solar really are uh, the way out for governments. Great. Well, thank you so much um, to everyone who's asked so many interesting questions and have joined us today. Um, please do go and explore the report and the data explorer tool that we have on the website. Um, and please feel free to follow up with any further questions after this. Uh, we look forward to continuing the, the conversation with you all as we accelerate the transition to, to clean electricity. Many thanks. Thank you, everyone.